First Corinthians chapter seven. First Corinthians chapter seven. We're going to jump back into it. Let's read verse fourteen again, just to sort of jog our memory again. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse fourteen. For the unbelieving husband, that means the lost one, right? For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Now, before the break, we talked about the fact that what Paul is writing in verse 14 is according to this new revelation that he has, the revelation of the mystery, and that is not according to the Old Testament law. Okay, um, now that the dispensation of the grace of God has begun, mixed marriages are permitted. And and what I mean by mixed marriages, especially in contrast to the Old Testament law, is a Jew can marry a Gentile. That was forbidden in the Old Testament law. Now, under the dispensation of the grace of God, because the distinction of Jew and Gentile has no bearing. Okay, on eternal salvation, you can have mixed marriages. You know, in the Old Testament, Jews were covenant people. They were in that system, so to speak. And so you only married within that. Now, under the dispensation of the grace of God, you can have an unbelieving Gentile married to a believing Gentile. Okay? Um, these are new, this is new territory that the Scripture had not really explored or given guidance on. And so now... Paul comes along and he has to address this because he is sent to minister to these crazy people. Okay? And so that's why we're getting these, these concepts. And so, um, so anyway, uh, by the way, just so you're aware, hold your place there in, in chapter 7 and go to the end of the book. Just know that when Paul is writing these concepts concerning marriage and children and all this stuff, he is writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Part of the reason why we know this is in verse 40. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 40, Paul writes this, "...but she is happier if she so abide after my judgment." And then look what it says at the last part of the verse. "...and I think also that I have the Spirit of God." Okay? Paul's saying, you know, his judgment here and his, you know, rules, if you will, that he's laying down, this is by the Spirit of God. He's writing by the Spirit. He has the Spirit of God. Um, now, if we read carefully in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, we'll see that a believing spouse sanctifies the unbelieving spouse. That's what it says. Okay? Also, the children of the believing spouse receive a particular status as a result of that believing person. Okay? Y'all with me? Alright. Now, this is where we got to be real careful to let the Bible define these concepts of being sanctified and being unclean and being holy. Okay? Very important that we do that because we've got to be careful that we don't assume this means lost and saved. Alright? So what does it mean that the spouse is sanctified by the believing spouse? Does it mean the unbelieving spouse is automatically saved based on the spouse's salvation? With that, does it also mean that the children of the saved person is automatically saved because of their salvation? So Cotton, you're saying, yeah, that means, let's say you're saved and Jean's not, but because y'all are married, she gets to go to heaven whether she believes in Jesus or not. Okay, interesting. So hang with me. Again, this is where we've got to define what the word sanctified means. 
Okay, how the Bible uses the word sanctified, because when we do that, we're going to see a whole different picture here, just to be quite honest with you. Okay, and so let's do that. Let's look at how the, the word sanctified is used in Scripture. Let's go first of all to the, the place of first mention, which is in Genesis. Go all the way back with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and look with me at verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and did what? Sanctified it. So this is the place of first mention of this word sanctified. So it says, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it He had rested from all of His work, which God created and made. Okay, here's my question. Does that mean God saved the Sabbath? <laughs> Cotton is going to try to die on that hill. But Cotton, you about to die. All right, look. It says there that He sanctified the Sabbath. It does not mean He saved it. He didn't rescue the seventh day from anything, did He? What does it mean? It means really that He designated it, okay? He distinguished it as a separate thing, okay? So sanctified here means what? To designate or to distinguish something, to separate it. All right, let's look at another instance. Go with me to Exodus chapter 19. By the way... Y'all can spend days on end just searching this word, sanctify, 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 sanctifying, and you will just have yourself a good old time, okay? Um, and I would encourage that. Uh, Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, come all the way down to verse 14. Exodus chapter 19, verse 14. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. Does this mean Moses saved Israel that day? <laughs> this is not a true question. <laughs> Y'all are so terrified. No, it doesn't. I tell you what it means. It means they prepared themselves. Okay? If you look at it in context, God says, Y'all come up this mount, but don't you touch this thing. You wait right here. I'm going to have a conversation with Moses, and when he comes down, something's going to happen. But they're not being saved from anything at this point. In fact, chapter 19 is where we get the Mosaic covenant. God's entering into a covenant with Israel. But to do that, He's got to prepare them. So He sanctifies them. He washes them. So in this particular scenario here, the word sanctified means to be prepared. They're preparing themselves for something. Let's look at another instance. Y'all go with me. Take a right turn and go to Leviticus chapter 8. This is not an exhaustive list. We're just, we, honestly, we're just kind of pogo sticking through the Scriptures here. We could get a bunch of different... Instances, and again, I encourage you to do it. Leviticus chapter 8. Now, Exodus, you get the law while they're in wandering. Laws concerning the tabernacle, the tent, the portable temple, okay? When you get to Leviticus, you get the law when they're in the land, the promised land, and you get things for the temple and the priesthood and all this stuff, right? And so that's where we're at. Leviticus chapter 8, um, look with me at verse 10. And Moses took the anointing oil, and he anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein, and sanctified them. Cotton. Does that mean Moses saved the tabernacle? Just say no, Cotton. No. Just say no. <laughs> he wants so bad for his answer to be right. Okay, That's what we all do, right? We all want our answer to be right, okay? 
The word sanctified there in Leviticus 8.10 does not mean he saved the tabernacle. What does it mean? It really means he set it up. He set it up for service. He prepared it. You can even say he distinguished it for a certain purpose. Okay? Otherwise, it was just material and logs and whatever else. It was just stuff. Well, that's a great way of defining it. That's exactly what he's doing with the tabernacle. Let me ask you, could the priest have gone in and ministered to the Lord without the temple being made ready? No, what would happen to them? Okay? It, it said that they used to put bells on the bottom of their garments and they would tie a rope to one ankle so that when the priest would go in, if they weren't right with God, and then they would hear the bell ring and then they'd drag them out. Because you ain't going in after them. <laughs> the second you step your toe in there, you're gone. Okay? Don't ask me to go get the dude. You know, that's his problem. You know, he can sit there and rot for all I care. I ain't done, you know. Uh, but, but here we see sanctified. It does, it does not mean to be saved from something, does it? Okay? Let's, let's jump over again. There's countless examples, countless times this word is used. Go with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verse 18. This is, you know, many would call this the high priestly prayer, right? Where Jesus is praying, praying for His brethren. Uh, start with me in verse 18. Jesus is speaking to the Father and He says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified, what? Through the truth. Now, is Jesus here talking about saving the disciples? Is that what the word sanctify means here? No. Okay? It means that the truth distinguished these disciples, and it certainly did that. It set them apart by preparing them. They were set up now for their ministry. Okay? Without the Lord Jesus giving them the truth, they were not set up. They were not well prepared. They were not made ready, were they? Okay? They had to have that. Now, this word sanctified is, is like a whole lot of words, whether in the Bible or, or in any, any language. You can have all these sort of variations of meaning. Okay? And there are a lot of times when the, the Apostle Paul uses the word sanctified to mean an, like an ongoing process. Okay? After someone has been saved, this ongoing process of wrangling your life under the Lordship of Christ. Okay? There are times where it's, it's said more holistically to even include justification, that He might sanctify you wholly, Paul says. Um, so it, it is sometimes used in a salvation-like way. But what you've got to learn to do is to dive into that passage and understand from the context whether or not it's which meaning it's using here. But y'all go with me to Romans chapter 15. Look at uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 16. Paul writes that, I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. That, that phrase there, sanctified by the Holy Ghost, in the context of Paul's writings, what does being sanctified by the Holy Ghost mean? Well, I can tell you what it means. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, it means being baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. It can mean being sealed by the Holy Spirit. It can mean being washed by the Holy Spirit. There's a whole range of meaning there that that can mean when we talk about being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Okay? Yeah, but it's what now? It's still being made ready. You're going to stick to that definition, aren't you? You stick to That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I like it. Um, 
Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. You see how this word sanctified can, can be broadened a little bit? Okay. When we are in Christ Jesus, that means we're already saved, we're sanctified. Okay. So there's a sanctifying, by the way, that can happen before justification, before we're saved. And there's a sanctification that can happen after. Okay? Because why? What does it mean, Rita? <laughs> I can be made ready before and after, can I? Now, what I'm being made ready for is different before salvation versus after, right? Okay? Now, how do you know which one it's talking about? Let me teach y'all something I learned in seminary. Context is king. Okay? you got to learn to study the context. And, and by the context, I mean the 30,000 foot view, which means the dispensational information, but then even on the more micro levels, verse to verse, word to word, concept to concept, and then compare Scripture with Scripture. Very important. Okay? But it says here, "...unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints, uh, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ the Lord, both theirs and ours." Go with me to chapter 6, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Again, I want you to see this sort of full range of meanings of the word sanctified. So that way when we come back to 1 Corinthians 7, we'll have a better grasp of, of this word sanctified. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. <coughs> Um, he said, let's we'll come back to verse 9 so you can get some context. Okay? Um, this was an old saying too in seminary. I, this drove me nuts because it sounded so preachy. They would say, a text without a context is a pretext. <sighs> that just drives me bananas. It sounds so Southern Baptist. <laughs> but there's a truth to it. Learn to pay attention to the context. Verse 9. Know ye not, by the way, ye, is that singular or plural? Remember, if it's, a, if it's a Y, it's like y'all, okay? Know y'all not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor effeminate, wow, uh, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed... But ye are what? Sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. See how sanctified there is sort of this broader meaning. It's sort of a, a capsule that pulls in a lot. I always thought sanctified was set, aside, set apart. Yes, that is one variation. That is one very, this is where we have to be careful because this happens especially like with the word repentance. A lot of times people get one definition and then what happens is you get going through Scripture, suddenly that definition doesn't quite fit. And there's a reason because there's a variation there. And so I think it's important that we get sort of a broader view of it. Now, notice there, there is a connection with sanctification and washing. Okay? Let me ask you all a question. Gene, once a month when you wash clothes... This is me twice a month. Okay. <laughs> she said twice a month. <laughs> when you wash a clothes, when you wash clothes, what's the difference from when the clothes go into the washer versus when they come out? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a change there, right? Something's different. What was it that made them different? There you <laughs> they, they were sanctified. They, they, something happened there to make them different. Okay? There was some exposure there. Now, it's important to note that part of the Holy Spirit's sanctifying work happens through His Word. Let me tell you, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, when y'all show up here, the Holy Spirit washes you. There is a washing work that happens by the Word. The Holy Spirit does that. Okay? Y'all turn with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. 
And start with me in verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. How? What was the thing that led to that? By the Word and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Uh, he says, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Okay? So the Holy Spirit has a washing effect. And when we study the Word, remember Romans ten seventeen says, um, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Okay? Now, the Word of God precedes the faith. It goes before the faith. And the Holy Spirit uses that Word to do a work of regeneration, a work of preparing, making... What's your definition? Making it ready. Bev's uh, uh, definition here, to start to set it apart. Like we saw back there in the Old Testament, to begin to distinguish it, to make it different. Okay? That's what sanctifying does. Go with me to 1 Timothy. Take a left turn and go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 4. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the Word of God in prayer. Hey, Cotton, when you sit down to eat and you pray before you eat, are you saving your food? <laughs> okay, thank you. You're not. You're sanctifying it, but you ain't saving it. <laughs> what you're really doing is you're designating it okay. Now notice there, it's with thanksgiving. When we give thanks to the Lord, God, there's, there's some dispensational information that happens here. God, thank you that you've made it okay for me to eat bacon today. Hallelujah. You know, God, thank you that today I don't have to stress about what's on my plate, whether or not it's kosher or not. Because today, under the dispensation of the grace of God, guess what? I'm permitted to eat it all. Hallelujah. Okay? And it's that recognition that designates this food okay. It sanctifies it. Okay? And so that's the issue here. Um, now, come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look with me at verse 14 again. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy? Let me ask you a question, Cotton. <laughs> is the unbelieving spouse saved because the other spouse is saved? <laughs> He's starting to learn. That's what I like about old Cotton. He's sharp, man. He's starting to learn. Okay? Now... When we just read that verse, we don't get that, though. What you've got to learn to do is read the context. Okay? Now, here's how we know it doesn't mean that he gets saved because of his wife's salvation, or she gets saved because of her husband's salvation, or that their children are automatically saved just because one parent is saved. Okay? But what the Bible's talking about here about being sanctified is an issue of being set apart about being made ready, about distinguishing, about separating. In the same way, when we get back into the Old Testament, the Lord separated and sanctified Israel for His purposes. It's the same thing in a family relationship today. If you've got one member of that family that is saved, they have a sanctifying effect on the rest of the group. Okay? I can tell you this, in my own personal life, in my own family growing up, I'm not saying that everybody in my family was necessarily lost. I just wasn't convinced that they were all saved. But I can tell you, every time we sat down at the dinner table, I was so convicted that we didn't just thank God for our food. And so finally, when, when I got into high school, still living at home, I started to ask my parents, hey, why don't, we, why don't we pray before we eat? 
that created some fights at times. But what started to happen because the Word of God was making an impact in me, it had an impact on them. It sanctified them. Okay? That's what it does. And it does it really automatically. Okay? It will have that kind of effect. And so... But the Bible here is not saying that they're automatically saved just because they're exposed to a believer. Here's what it does say. Keep reading. Verse, verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. Let me pause here. This is a whole different topic for another day. I know that even in this crowd, we've, we've had divorce in, in our families before. I get that. My parents were divorced. Let me say this. If you were married to a spouse and that spouse was not saved and they, you got a divorce, you're free from that marriage. You're as free as if they were dead. That is the one exception whereby you can be released from that marriage. I know, I know that's a big topic. I know that's a big topic. Yep, listen. Go ahead. Both of them weren't saved. They're free. I don't know. I don't know if he were saved or if he was saved. <laughs> we need to have that conversation. Okay, so... Alright, so, so here's the thing. Again, hey... This is one of those... Yeah, hey, look, that's right. So here, here's what I just did. I just dropped a nuclear bomb on this thing. I just said that's just quick. I know it's a big can of worms. We'll come back to that one. Okay? But what I want you to see, notice how Paul is having, under the dispensation of the grace of God, this is the first time now we're, we're dealing with mixed marriages. And, and these people are like clamoring, like, well, what do we do? What do we do? <laughs> does this mean? Does this mean? What does this mean? And so Paul's having to instruct. Okay, now keep going. He says, he says, a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. He said, listen, as much as is possible, he says as elsewhere in Scripture, he says, as much as is possible and within your ability, maintain peace. Okay, maintain peace. Now, look at verse 16. Why? Why? If I as a believer, were, if I were married to an unbeliever, why would I seek to stay at peace with that spouse? Look what verse 16 says. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? This is how we know back there in verse 14, being sanctified doesn't mean being saved. Because the possibility still exists within that marriage that you could still get saved, according to verse 16. Okay? He says, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Okay? And, and so, it, it's interesting here that we've got to be careful. When we come to verse 14, we see that word sanctified, that we don't assume that means to get saved. What we need to do is investigate the Word throughout Scripture and see how it's used. And what we will discover is that sanctified means a lot of different things, but one of them is what? To make ready, to expose even, to wash with what? In particular, the Word or the truth, even as Jesus prayed for His disciples, that they would be sanctified through the truth and prepared. Sanctified means to be prepared or to distinguish through the exposure to the truth. So there's a whole lot of things there. But what it doesn't mean in verse 14 is that just because an unbeliever is married to a believer that they're automatically saved. That's not what it means because in verse 16, the possibility exists that they might might get saved by being in that marriage. Now, why would the possibility be stronger that the unbeliever might get saved in that marriage? Because that's about the only way they're going to get exposed to the truth. Y'all stop and think about it in your lifetime, with the exception of being at church, how many times have you just been going out there in your normal life and somebody came up to you randomly and shared the gospel? I can tell you, for me personally, and I mean that. Yeah. Now, I'm talking outside of church. I'm talking about just out and about in real life. This is how rare it is. So, this is why the one... 
Uh, yes, right, at the bowling thing. And praise God, now you're sanctified. And so, like, here it is. So, here's it. That is kind of cool, actually, now that I think about it. You're going to make me cry. And so, anyway, like, you think about this. The scripture indicates here there is a higher probability that a person would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because they've been sanctified by the washing of regeneration by the Word of God. The Holy Spirit uses that relationship. We've always got to keep in mind the bigger picture here in this life. It is not about the right here and now. We are to set our affection on things above, not on things of this earth. And sometimes that means we got to suck it up. That is not fun. It's not. Now, let me pause here. Let's say you've kind of messed up on this. Okay? Like, Gene, I'm, I'm just going to talk to you for just a second. Because I can see you're, you're going like, man, I, I don't know. Am, am I living in an adulterous relationship with cotton now? Here's the truth, Gene. Here's the truth. God's grace has covered you. That doesn't mean we go live willy-nilly. Okay? It doesn't mean if it is gone south, you need to go divorce him and then redo things. No. Okay? God's grace has covered you. Okay? Listen, He's covered every single one of us. Every single one of us. Whether it's in marriage, whether it's some bad habit, whatever it may be, He's covered all of us. Don't freak out. Don't go jump off a cliff. Don't go file for divorce. Okay? <laughs> Gene's like, I was looking for an out. <laughs> I just totally ripped it out of you. <laughs> poor Cotton. Poor God. He's just, he's like a pin cushion. He's like the voodoo doll. You know, you just poke pins in, you know. And so, you know, you know be, be careful here. I, I, here's what can happen. Sometimes we can make grace sound very legalistic. Well, the Bible says if your spouse was an unbeliever or, or was a believer and you divorced, well, now you're you're messed up. No, you got to be careful here. We got to be very careful. Now, I will not pull back from saying what exactly the word tells us here. The word does tell us there there are actually two exceptions, two reasons for a legitimate, complete, actual break of a marriage union that God has brought together. One is death. That's why when you stood at the altar, you said, "Till death do us part." The second is if they're unbelieving and they divorce you. Okay? <laughs> what does the Word tell us? <laughs> Again, see, this is what I'm saying. We can make grace be very legalistic, right? Okay? Come back to verse 16, though. What does it say? It, it says this, Who knows spiritually what could still come of your marriage? Yeah, it's ugly. Now, as ugly as it may look to you through human eyes, imagine looking at it through the perfect, pure eyes of God. They're all ugly. <laughs> and so, we really need some grace, right? And so... We've got to be careful there. What I want to draw out from this study, okay, now I know we've kind of got off track a little bit there. Uh, it, back in verse 14, what we've got to be careful that we don't think, and especially as it relates to the children in that family, okay? The children are not saved. The Scripture is not telling us that the children are saved on the basis of their parents' salvation, Okay? Um, and vice versa. The Scripture is not saying if both parents are lost and they're under the age of accountability, then they are lost for an eternity and condemned to the eternity in the lake of fire. Not what it's saying. Not anywhere close. Okay? This is, this, this is a very important topic and one I think it's worth our, our you know, attention and exploration. And so again, we've got to be very careful. Here's what it means if a child grows up in a home with two unbelieving parents. It means they've never been sanctified.
Does it mean they're lost? Does it mean if they die under the age of accountability, they're going to an eternity in hell? No. Okay? And so again, I think this is where we've got to be very careful in our study to let the Word speak. Okay? I think it's very, very, very important.